of challenges, and every one of those challenges has as its root sin. What is sin? Let me give you a very brief definition of sin. Sin is simply this. Sin is rebellion against God. That's all sin. All sin is rebellion against God. It all started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. God said, listen, you can have everything. There's one thing you can't have. And they rebelled against God. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Listen, the end result of all sin is death. The end result of all sin is death. But here's the good news. The good news is that God sent into this world his only begotten son to deal with the sin problem. Jesus Christ came into this world and he took our place. He was without sin, yet he died on a cross in our place. He was placed in the grave. He arose again on the third day. And by his resurrection, and because he arose from the grave, sin has been dealt with. And now we can have a new life. Now listen, that new life in Christ begins when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Now listen, that new life leads to a new lifestyle, a new way of living today, and in addition to that, eternal life at the coming of Jesus Christ. So we have a sin problem in our world. It's very evident everywhere you look, we can see the result of sin, a result of rebellion against God. God said, listen, I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to send my son to deal with that rebellion against me. And Jesus Christ took upon himself our penalty. And today we may have a new life, a new way of living. Say, what is that new way of life? What is that new lifestyle you're talking about? Listen, it's simply this. That is, we live our life as Jesus wants us to live. To live our life today the way God wants us to live. Not how we want to live, because listen, the Bible tells us that by nature we want to sin. By nature, that's the, the natural thing to do. But in Christ, there's a new life. In Christ, we have a brand new life, a new hope, a new lifestyle. I want you to look. Jesus already dealt with that. I want you to go back to the book of Second Chronicles, if you will. I'm going to show you something. Second Chronicles chapter 6. I want you to listen to a part of the prayer that Solomon offered at the, at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, in chapter 6, Solomon prays that he talks about many of the sins that God's people may commit. He's talking about God's people. He talks about the sins that they may commit individually or as a nation. After he is given those, and he doesn't list all the sins, but he lists some of those sins. I want you to notice if we will in chapter 6 and verse 39. Listen to what he says. Then hear their prayers. He said, listen, when you sin, you pray. Then hear their praise, God, and their petitions from heaven where you live. And uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. Oh, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to all the prayers made to you in this place. God answered that prayer. And the answer is found in the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 12. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Now listen to the next verse. Then, when all this happens, all the disasters that would happen in your nation, then if my people, God's people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? Pray. When disasters come, when things happen in our world, God says, listen, tell my people to pray. Tell them to pray and seek my face, that is, seek God's favor, and turn from their wicked way. Does God's people have wicked ways? Listen, anytime we do not do what God wants us to do, that's sin. There are sins of 
commission, we do what we shouldn't do. There's also sins of omission, not doing what God wants us to do. And sometimes things happen in our nation, and sometimes we face the judgment of God because of things we do not do. Listen, it says, and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and what? Restore their land. The King James Version says, heal. See what he's saying? God is saying, listen, folks. When we see the results of sin in our world, we see all the things that disasters and so on. God said, listen, my people. If my people will pray, I'll do something. Listen, I will heal their land. I will restore their land. You see, all the problems we're facing, all the, the wickedness and the violence and the spirit of animosity, all those things can be taken care of through prayer. Well, God says so. God says when things happen, if my people will pray, I will hear from heaven and I will restore their land. Wow. Now, when you go to the New Testament, you'll find this is the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus made a promise to his disciples. He said, listen, one day when I go back to heaven, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will live in every believer. Every person who knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior, listen, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our life. That's the third person of the Trinity. God person living in the life of every believer. Now, Jesus did go back to heaven. And Jesus did send the Holy Spirit. Turn to the book of Acts, if you will, chapter 1. Book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 8. This is what Jesus said. He's talking to his disciples. Now, this is just before he goes back to heaven. Before he goes back to heaven, listen to what he says to his disciples. And you will, you will, not maybe, it's going to happen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, you're going to receive the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, I will enable you, listen, I will enable you to go into all the world. You know, I noticed something in this, in this passage. When you read the Great Commission, it isn't go to Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria. It's all, it's all together. See what he says? In Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The gospel is to be taken into all the world. Jesus said, listen, you're going to receive power. Power to go out and be my witnesses. Why? Listen, when people are saved, lives are changed. And when lives are changed, communities are changed. And when communities are changed, the world can be changed. You say, could that happen? Read the book of Acts. When God's people went out in the power of the Holy Spirit and in prayer, God changed communities, whole communities, and lives were changed. Listen, folks, that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. That same Holy Spirit who came on the day of Pentecost and indwelled the believers then, listen, that same Holy, that same Holy Spirit indwells every believer today. And Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You go out and tell the world that I came to deal with the sin problem. I dealt with the sin problem. And if you'll come to me and commit your life to me, I'll give you a new life today and eternal life at the coming of, again of Christ. Wow. The greatest need, listen, the greatest need in our world today is to know Jesus Christ. To know Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. That's real, almost the very end of your Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want you to look at verse 9. Peter says, The Lord 
isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. Now listen. No, he is patient for your sake. He does not. Underline that word not if you do it in your Bible. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. But wants everyone to repent. It's pretty clear. Peter said, listen, it's not God's will that anyone be destroyed in a little burning hell fire. That's not God's will. God's will is for people to be saved. Jesus came and dealt with the sin problem. He said, listen, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit into the world. The Holy Spirit is going to indwell your life. And as believers, you go out and take the gospel and my gospel and your prayers will change lives. According to the scripture, Jesus came and died. That John 3, 16 be fulfilled. Whosoever believeth in him would not what? Perish, but have what? Everlasting life. It's all so simple. It's so simple. Jesus came and dealt with the sin promise. He said, now listen, church, you have been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given the power of God that can literally change lives, can deal with wickedness, can deal with with violence, can deal with murder, can deal with war, can deal with famine. All the problems you want to mention, it, the root of it is sin. And Jesus says, if you will go out and be my witnesses, I'll change lives. It's not my will that anyone should perish, that everyone should be saved. So, Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit, and the church has received the Holy Spirit. Now, What's the problem? What's the problem? Research is showing that between 4,000 and 7,000 churches in America will close this year. Between four and 7,000 churches will close in America this year. In addition to that, 80% of the churches in America are stagnant or declining. Why? The scripture said, Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will empower you to be different and to make a difference in the world. I want to know why. Why are so many churches closing? Why are so many churches stagnant or dying? Let me give you my opinion. I, I'm right. Okay. Here's my, listen, two reasons why churches die. Number one, you forget whose church it really is. People say, well, yes, it's our church. You know, we're going to do it our way. We've always done it this way. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Listen, it's not our church. So we refer to Stones Creek as our church, and I do too, because it's a church where I work and where I love and where I uh, deal with God's people and work together. But it's not our church. If it's our church, I guarantee it's going to die. What did Jesus say? I'll build my church. When the church ceases to be his, folks, it's going to die. It's going to die. Jesus gave a pattern for his church. He said, my church will survive. My church will thrive. My church will make a difference. Churches die because they forget whose church it really is. The second reason... Why churches die. They forget what their mission is. For many churches, the mission is, well, we'll come together on Sunday, and we'll do our thing, and we'll go to Sunday school, and we'll sit through church, and then we'll go home, and we've done our thing. And we've got all these little things we have on our account. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going to do all these little things. And then, Lord, why isn't our church growing? What is the mission of the church? The Bible is very clear. The mission of the church, Jesus said, when you get power, you're going out into the world and you're going to make a difference. 
You're going to go out in prayer and in believing and change the world. And if we forget that is our mission and we become all about us, what we want and how we're going to do, I guarantee you the church is going to die. Jesus said, listen, I've already dealt with the same problem. Now your deal, you're going to go out in my power, in the Spirit of God, in the Old Testament, he told his people, listen, y'all just repent. Y'all just get right with God. When you do, I'll hear from heaven. I'll restore your land. In the New Testament, he said, listen, I've given you the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to you to go out into the world. Listen, God works today by the Holy Spirit through the church. When I say church, I'm not talking about a building. We are the church. Individually, you are the church. Jesus works through the church today. He's done everything he's going to do. He says to the church now, you go out do my will. There's no reason, no reason in the world in America why any church should die. If they will recognize whose church it really is and recognize what the mission of the church is and begin to do it. There's too many people out there that are lost. Too many people lost. That every church could be overflowing with people. Jesus said, listen, I've got the answer. I've got the solution. I've got, listen, if the church doesn't want well, listen, to me, the call is the church needs to be the church. You know, <laughs> I they mean whether they say this or not, but it's it's true. You'd be better off these churches just die and get out of the way. Because the devil loves to say, <laughs> look at that old church over there. Y'all just look. You know, there's nothing over there. There's nothing going on. God is dead. God's not real anymore. It'd be a whole lot better. Those churches who do not recognize whose church it is and what their mission is, they just die and get out of the way. Let God's church, listen, the church triumphant. It's alive. It's well. God is doing great things in his world when his church does what he asked them to do. He said, you're going to get power. Now go out in my name and do something for me. Listen, prayer is the greatest tool to deal with evil. We can say the church can no longer sit back and complain, oh, how bad our world is. How bad our, we know why the world is bad. We know why God says, now I've given you a tool to deal with that. And the tool is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not what we can do. It's what God can do working through his church, through his people. Amen? Well, some of you are still awake. That's the truth. Read the word. Read the word. The early church, they went out in the power of God and in prayer. Over and over again in the book of Acts, God's people prayed. The Holy Spirit's power came and lives were changed. Lives were changed. God is doing great things in his world with those who will trust him in the power of the Spirit. I'm calling for some prayer warriors. I'll tell you, God has blessed Stones Creek Church, and I'll tell you the reason why. The main reason God has blessed Stones Creek Church, we got a lot of people pray. And God promised, listen, my people pray, I'm going to do something. We got people praying, that's why God is doing something here at Stones Creek Church. Guess what? I want more. <laughs> I want God to do more. There's so much more out there that needs to be done. God's ready to do it. He's waiting on us to do it. I'd like to, I'm calling for some prayer warriors. I thought like prayer warriors. I think it's time for the church to stop being defensive and go on the offense. It's easy to be defensive. Well, you know, we, we're just a little church. Not much we can do. And, you know, we need to quit making excuses. We need to say, we're going on the offense. How do you do that? How do you go on the offense? Just do what God says. When my people pray, and my people believe, and my people go out in, my, in the power of the Holy Spirit and prayer, I'll change things. I'll change the world. I'd like to call, in addition to those who already pray, I'd like to call for some prayer warriors. Some prayer warriors, <clears throat> I'm going to set us up one night a month. One night a month. Hopefully you're praying every day. But one night a month. The first Tuesday night of every month. We used to be deacon meeting that night. 
first Tuesday night of every month, I want everyone who wants to really pray that God will do more and we will be faithful. We will pray for the lost. They will come together. We're not going to have a party. We're not going to have refreshments. We're not going to do any of it. We're not going to sit around and gossip and talk about all the bad things. We're coming together just to pray. I mean, just to pray, God, I want your will to be done in my life. God, I want you to use this church. Use our witness to see people saved, see lives change. Listen, when lives change, it makes all the difference in the world. So if you want to be a part of that prayer warrior team, just set aside the first Tuesday night of every month, 7 o'clock, we'll meet and we'll just pray. We'll pray. Do what God said in the book of Chronicles. Do what the early church did. Just set aside that time to pray. I want people to say, you know, if you want to see God at work, go over at Stones Creek Church. <laughs> go over there and see what God is really doing. You know, tomorrow is Veterans Day. Day we remember those who, who gave their life for our country. Listen, one of the greatest things you can do to honor those who gave their life for our freedom, live for God. They fought for our freedom. Many of those it, going all the way back fought for our freedom. We have that freedom today. One of the greatest things we can do to honor them is by being what God has called us to be. Coming together and praying and believing, trusting God that others will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. I've had people say, well, you know, I'd like to see so-and-so say that, but I don't believe they ever will. Well, that's what the devil likes to hear. I want to say, devil, I know my God. And I got people I've been praying for for a long time, and I'm not going to give up. Because I know my God is able, and he says, if my people will pray and believe and trust, I'll do miracles. I'll do miracles. God will do it. Pray. God's power is available to change the world. Listen, he's in control of the whole world. And he says, my Holy Spirit can change lives and change the world. I believe that. I believe that. And I believe God can do some unbelievable, humanly speaking, unbelievable things through your life and through this church. Because we know what our mission is. We know whose church it is. It's not our church, it's his church. We know what our mission is, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it, and then leave the rest up to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father... I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm thankful, Lord, that even with all the problems and the challenges we face as a nation, you've already told us how to deal with it. In the Old Testament, you told your people, just pray, and I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal, restore their land. Father, you're ready to do that now. You're ready to do it in 2015. You're just waiting on your people who are spirit-filled, endowed with the power of God to pray faith-believing, expecting the mighty God to do what he promises in his word. So, Father, I want to thank you in advance for all that you have done and all that you're going to do through this church. Because you have placed in this church men and women and young people, teenagers, who love you and who will be the men and women and young people that you've called us to be. And we will see the power of God in this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing in closing a, a great hymn, a great hymn of, of faith. As Greg comes to lead us in this closing hymn, there may be some here this morning who have never really known Christ, never really asked Him to come into your heart and be your Savior. He can change your life, I guarantee you. The power of God can change lives. If so, why not come today and say, today I'm making my commitment to Christ.
Maybe it's, we're going to sing just one verse. I don't, I don't like long invitations. If God speaks, it's your time to move. And if you're here this morning and you just feel burdened to pray for someone else, maybe it's someone that's lost, why don't you just come here to the altar and just say, Lord, I want to bring Jim, Mary, Joe, whatever. I want to bring them to you. I want to believe you for their salvation. Okay, let's stand together as we sing that first verse.